Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the live broadcast of the Fleetwood Town Fans Forum. After a few technical issues with uh, our guests tonight, we've finally made it. Uh, so what we're going to be doing for the next hour or so, we're going to be answering all your questions. We've had loads of questions from uh, Onward Card holders in the last 24 hours. And also, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you'll be able to enter your comments in the, the, pan, in the, the, the comment section below. So hopefully, because we had technical issues, hopefully we'll be able to introduce our first guest. It's our chairman, Andy Pilly. Andy, are you with us? Andy? Yes, good evening, everybody. Thank good. you, Will. Good to see you. And also um, our new head coach, Simon Grayson. Good evening, everyone. The wonders of technology. We are live. So, so yes, yeah, just a very quick one. We'll, we'll, we'll start with, with the, the new manager. Being a bit of a whirlwind, how's your first week been? Is it a week already? Uh, <laughs> no, it's been really good, obviously, from meeting uh, the chairman at the weekend to being in on Monday morning um, in the midst of a, the, the deadline day. We were looking to do a few deals, get to know the staff in terms of my staff um, and staff around the, um, the training ground. There's been very much a, a busy period, but um, we did what we needed to do on, uh, on Monday. And then it was all about getting the players in on, on Tuesday to do some work. On the training pitch, have a few meetings of what we expect from them from, from now to the end of the season, see what we're going to do um, onto the training pitch, ultimately to get some work into the players. Same again yesterday, a few more meetings, a bit more uh, time on the grass as well, working out individuals, strength, weaknesses, how we're going to play at the weekend and for the rest of the season. And then today has been a day off for the players, but for the manager, he doesn't have a day off, he's constantly working. And uh, and looking forward to it. It's been brilliant. I obviously really enjoyed meeting everybody. The training ground is such a vibrant place, even though we're going through real tough times at the moment and it isn't as busy as normal with, with people being in amongst it. Um, the staff have been really good and really helpful to help me and David Dunn settle in. Players have been good, embraced what we're trying to do so far and uh, can't really wait for the weekend now to come along and, and get, get back um, into that dugout and try and get us back to winning ways. I noticed that when you said you haven't had a day off, the chairman started smiling. So that and that must be a that must be the one for him. Um, Andy, easy question for you straight away. I mean, why Simon? I think numerous reasons, really. I think uh, I've known Simon for a long time uh, throughout my my tenure as chairman. I've, we've crossed paths on lots of occasions. We've always got on very well. I think it's fair to say that uh, the chemistry is there. Uh, we share the same love of football, and um, so in, in that. Respect. Uh, it's well documented. Simon has won four promotions from League One. You don't win one promotion with good luck. You cannot be fortunate to get a club promoted. To win four is exceptional. But I think I think you can look further really as well because of the four clubs that Simon has steered out of this division, three have gone on to get to the Premier League. And in that respect, it's fair to say that Simon has laid the foundations for that football club to subsequently find its way to the uh, to the top league. And equally, I mean, Preston North End, uh, we, we, we all admire what's gone on at Preston, and they are a solid championship club. And uh, again, I'm sure Simon has played his part there. So I think it's a really good fit uh, for us as a football club. I want to get the championship, and I think Simon can be the man who steers the club there. Great to hear. So we, we, we've been taking questions for the last 24 hours, initially from our onward card holders, and we also plenty are coming in on our screen on the right-hand side. So like I say, if you're on Facebook or, to, or YouTube, get your questions in. And once we've got through some of these, we'll try and get through um, some of the some of the ones on the right-hand side as well. Great to see the comments coming in, and plenty of you are watching live. So that's great news. So we'll start with the, we'll start at the top, really. Um, one for Simon Grayson. It's about Chad Evans. Um, I, I, did you consider recalling Chad? Can you recall Chad? What's the situation with Chad Evans? That's Gary Wilson who asked that. Well, might as well start off with a difficult one, eh? Hey? <laughs> no easy way in and embedding into the questions. Um, basically, Chad, Chad had left the, the football club to go to, on loan to Preston North End before I got into the building. Uh, the rules were that we couldn't recall him back anywhere. Um, I think there is an already an agreement in place for potentially Preston to turn that into a permanent basis. Um, so it wasn't really anything I could do about. I've liked Ched as a player. Um, I've really been pleased with how he played. I've tried to sign him on a couple of occasions at different football clubs. 
But in terms of Chad, one, we couldn't bring him back because of the rules of the um, of the agreement on the EFL rules. Um, and the future is in Preston North hands, North End hands, really, that they hold the key. They want to turn it into a permanent or not. Or not um, we'll have to wait and see. Right, and we'll move on to uh, to, to the chairman. Um, Tyler Dodd has asked the question. It's about the pandemic. I think you'll probably get a lot of these tonight, Andy, about the, the effects the pandemic has had on, on everything Fleetwood Town. But the first one is, what is the hardest thing been to cope with during the pandemic for you? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, to state the obvious, we have no revenue streams virtually as a football club. Uh, we've no fans coming in for the turnstiles. We've no secondary spend. Uh, Fleetwood as a club, we are uh, we, we're quite, we're quite different to a lot of football clubs because a lot of revenue comes through Poolful, which is a real community facility. And uh, we have the, the pitches that are hired out and subsequently food and beverage. And uh, none of that's happened at all. So that has been a, a real uh, a real hammer blow, really, for the football club financially. But for me, the biggest, I mean, to answer the question, the biggest and the hardest thing to deal with has been that we haven't known when it's going to end. Because normally, if you know you have a problem, you can establish how long that problem is going to be in play for, and you can subsequently make a plan to, to find your way through that difficult period. But when it's open-ended, it's very difficult to plan for the future. Um, I mean, we are hoping now, we're hoping that we're going to get some sort of normality come April, May time. Uh, but that has really been the most difficult thing. We thought we were through it with lockdown one. We thought we were going to get supporters back September, October. We never did. I think on the Tuesday, uh, we were we were due to have a, a test game and we'd gone through all sorts of um, regulation with the league, with the local council to finally get supporters back inside the stadium. We we're allowed a thousand from memory and we got that pulled at probably two or three days before. And so far this season, we haven't had anybody in. So uh, the inability to plan has definitely been the hardest thing for me, Tyler. So we, we've got the comments coming in from all over and occasionally we'll be adding some to the bottom. This is one from Cobb's blog, which is Ben Natman, our very own um, blogger. He's watching live tonight and his question is, good to see Simon. An appointment that raised eyebrows, but I feel he's the right man for the job. Do you feel this is the club to get your fifth promotion, Simon? By the way, I've thrown you in the deep end with two tough two <laughs> questions there, but yeah, that's, that's Ben there for you. Uh, yeah, well, look, I've come to a football club that I know is, has got hunger, desire. I've got a, an owner who has certainly got all them um, qualities about him as well. And if I didn't think I could achieve um success with a football club i wouldn't have taken it on board i've been offered a few uh, opportunities to go back to work in the last year um not ones that i felt would give me the right platform the right tools the right opportunity to to be successful i think when i looked at fleetwood town even before uh, the, the vacancy came available it was always one that i thought would be a, a good fit for me because of the facilities and the owner um, and this group of players and the success that the club has had over a number of years now. Well, a good number of years, many, many years, should I say. So um, that, was a, that was a massive part of it. Just because I've come here doesn't guarantee that I can get a fifth promotion. Um, it's, that's what's happened in the past. But what I will be doing, I will be working extremely hard to make sure that we are successful, whether it's this season, next season or whenever. I want this football club to progress and, and try and get to a to a level of where the club has never been before. So um, hopefully we're going to head in the direction. Um, look, we've we've still we're obviously in a, a run at the moment that is not easy for us, but we've got we hopefully could have tried to break that mould very quickly and get back to winning ways and see where it takes us. I wouldn't have. I've got so much hunger, desire, and um, passion in me that I want to make this football club successful. I agreed with the with. Um, the owner that we um, we've worked to the end of the season. I want to be here longer. My success at football clubs all about being there for two, three, four years, where I've left them in a good state uh, when I've eventually moved on. So I want to build a football club. I want to keep being passionate, and I've got that. I've got that desire in me. I know that I've got fire in my belly to uh, to be successful, and uh, I do feel that everything is a good fit for us at this moment in time. Brilliant. And we, we've also got tonight, we've also got Steve Kerwood, our chief exec, uh, waiting in the wings. I don't know if uh, Steve can join us for a second. Steve, hello, good evening. You're right. Caught me by surprise there. <laughs> You're in the waiting room and you've been thrown in the deep end. So welcome aboard, Steve. Steve will be joining us if there's any business side of questions. And, and the next question is um, 
And it's, it's actually Ben Natman again, actually, but it's one that was pre-empted. Um, How's the training ground going? You, we, we've talked in the past about domes and investment in the academy and, and in growth of the fantastic pool foot facility. Where is that and has that been affected by the pandemic? Yeah, the, the dome is all part of a, a greater plan for the academy to achieve Category 2 stages, something that it's not an overnight thing. We've been working on this throughout the uh, the period of lockdown with those who've been in the building and the academy have been working incredibly hard to get all the auditory elements in place so that when the uh, EFL auditors come and check what we're doing, that we are perceived to be doing the right thing and we very much are. One big part of being able to go Category 2 um, is the Dome. We've um, applied to the council on a, a pre-application basis. You basically tell the council what you're going to do before you formally apply and they tell you the sort of things they're going to look for in an application. They've been very favourable in their commentary around what they need for the formal application. So now we are going through um, all the boring bits, acoustic engineers, lighting engineers, just to ensure that we've got all the reports we need to submit the formal application, which will go in in the next few weeks. Um, and we also have the small element of funding in relation to this. And the Football Foundation at the moment is coming under massive pressure, as you can imagine, uh, with some of their funds being diverted to other elements within the game. Um, and obviously Andy and his support um, obviously is also suffering. So at the moment we're working still hard on a plan to achieve this. Can we achieve this by September? Yes, we hope to do so. Um, is it possible we might not achieve it? Again, also, there's a lot of things we've got to get over, but ultimately the, the commitment is there to drive the football club, uh, football club forward. We'd be delighted if we can achieve it by um, the time of next season, and we still hope to do so. But let's watch this space. And ultimately, the I suppose the headlines is that uh, Andy's commitment is to, to see this moving forward, and certainly it will develop pool foot, and we'll be able to have a, a greater pool of uh, academy players as we move forward. So it's all positive. But obviously, the uh, the lockdown period and all the elements of that have caused some frustrations, as you can imagine. Great. I mean, anybody who's been to to Pilfort will tell you that um, it's a it's a fantastic place. And the sooner we see it full of people and full of the community once again, I think we'll all be happier. This is a question for Andy from Paul Ross. Um, sorry, from John Powell. Paul Ross is, is shortly John Powell. Uh, you have a record of appointing untried managers, but ones that you see in having potential in the past: Mickey Mellon, Graham Alexander and Joey Barton, but also experienced managers like Tony Greenwood, Stephen Presley, Uwe Rosler, John Sheridan, and now Simon Grayson. What goes into your decision of which manager you choose? What What's the process behind that? I think each and every time you've always got to have the best interest of the football club at heart, and you've got to, you've got to connect with somebody, you've got to think, this is the individual that, hand on heart, I believe is the right choice to, to drive this football club forwards and to achieve our targets. And again, myself and Simon, we met, we spoke on Saturday. Uh, we've met on numerous occasions in the past, but we met on Sunday morning. Uh, Simon was due on Sky for the Leeds Leicester uh, punditry. And so we met at Pool for early doors on Sunday and we just had a really honest conversation. To me, it felt like we connected. It felt like um, it worked for us and it worked for Simon. I think, as Simon has described, uh, we're an attractive proposition given that the infrastructure, the uh, the training ground, the good squad uh, is in play. Um, we're very, very fortunate, I believe, to to have on board now a hugely experienced manager who will be able to get the best out of the existing squad and to drive the football club forwards um, and to, to make the progress that, uh, that I and everyone else so much desires. So the questions are still coming in on the on the right hand side. Here's a question from Jay, which you can see along the the bottom. Um, how do you intend to solve the problem with a lack of goals? I think this is for Simon Grayson. We've scored one in five and haven't won since the twelfth of December. Well, I can give that to the owner. He can answer it if he wants. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not getting my boots back out, so that's for sure. I've never had a great record as a as a goal scoring midfielder or, or defender. Basically, what we're going to do is try and find the right combination, right system, um, 
there's some very talented players at our football club, and it's and obviously they've just lost the way a little bit. We re, we have to re, reignite the fire and the desire in them. They've all got qualities that they can bring to the uh, to, to bring to the team. I've got to find the right players within the right system to make sure that we get the balance between being tough to play against in terms of with and without the ball, defensively being good, but good have the creativity at the top end of the pitch. Maybe we. We say we're not scoring enough goals and, and that's maybe down to maybe the odd striker missing the opportunities. But also you can then say, are we creating enough opportunities in, last number of, in that number of games? So it's about trying to get that right balance right, the right personnel in. And that's what I've, I've had to learn very quickly. I know a lot about the players previously anyway, before I even came to the football club, what qualities they've got, maybe what weaknesses they've got. And um, I've learned a lot about them in the last 48 hours on the training pitch as well. So we, we're working hard to to do everything right, to do whatever is required to go and win as quickly as possible. And let's hope that that's a sign of Saturday against Bristol Rovers. And uh, we want to see a team that is running, fighting for every lost ball. We want a team competing. When I'm putting the bodies on the line, we want players to be expressive at the top end of the pitch. I think one thing that I've said to the players is, from day one, is you will never hear me having a go at you in the top end of the pitch if you're wanting to try and express yourselves, if you're trying to do something creative, um, because that's how I want my players to be. If they're trying to do a nutmeg on the, the edge of our 18-yard box and it results in a goal, then they might just see a different side to me. But I want to give them that free freedom to go and play at the top end of the pitch, because that's how I've always tried to be at all the clubs that I've been at. But I also want to make sure that we're very hard to play against and make sure no any team that we're playing against are not in for an easy ride. So um, if we can throw all them ingredients into the pot at the weekend um, with the personnel, whichever team I decide to put out, there is competition for places. And I think the players who get that starting shirt at, at the weekend have got to make sure that they keep it for the, pre, the next 20 games as well, because that is something that I will outline to them. You've got the shirt, make sure you do enough to say, Gaffer, you can't drop me now. And, and I'm happy if we uh, we have that at attitude and uh, result. Looking out the window at Poolfoot the other day, the other thing you learned about is the reminder of the weather at the Fire Coast. Your first two days, the rain sideways. I bet you haven't missed that about the Fire Coast. Well, it was, it was funny because when I met the owner on Sunday, it was beautiful sunshine. Even on, on even on Monday, it was nice sunshine when the players were off. We opened the door up at quarter to eight, I think it was on uh, Tuesday, and the gust of wind hit me, and it was melting as well. But it's something that I've been used to for many, many years. It's uh, it's, it's not the right side of the pen on the Pennines in terms of where I'm from and that, but it's it's very close to my heart, and I certainly know that um, what it means to the supporters in the area. So being uh, being involved in a wind tunnel isn't something that I'm un, un, unused to. And this is one for Andy on a, on a bit more of a series now. This is from Stephen Whittle. Uh, Andy, is it true that the club are currently in a transfer embargo? And if so, how long before we can sign players again? OK, firstly, we're not in a transfer embargo. And um, I'm sure all the sporters will be aware. We've signed Cal Vassell in the January window. We've signed uh, Dan Batty. We've signed Yanius Danassian. And that name took quite a lot of practice, if I'm mm -hmm. going to be honest. It's been known as JD around the training ground. Uh, so we're not in a transfer embargo. That is not it's not correct. Uh, we've also brought Harrison Biggins and Nathan Sherman back. So I can confirm that is that is incorrect. Well, that's good news. Um, I won for Simon on, on the team, John Greenall. Um, where is Wes Burns? <laughs> Simple. Uh, wait, where, where's Wally? Is that what is that? The yeah, thing? Uh, <laughs> Um, Wes picked up an injury, um, I think it was at um, Hull uh, late on in the game, um, so he's, not, he's been unavailable last couple of games, um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have him back um, into training very soon and being available for selection. It's not a major injury that he's got this moment in time, it's just a slight muscle tear. Nice and simple there, one for Andy. Um... This is from Sean Young. With a number of first-team players out of contract in the summer and Simon only currently contracted to the summer, who's making the decisions on renewals of contracts at the moment ahead of the, the running out in the summer? I think the, the the contract status is something which is very fluid and it's not unusual for players to be offered contracts before the end of the season. And uh, it may be that uh, decisions on things like options, which some players have, will be made at the end of the season. Uh, but it's not something which concerns me. 
I believe in the hierarchy of the club and uh, the manager of the football club and the uh, the senior uh, footballing staff would always have a say in who we intend to uh, to keep. And and obviously, when we have certainty as to who the manager is, is going to be uh, next season, uh, they would have the, the ultimate say in who we're signing anyway. Uh, when it comes to the recruitment of players, my belief is, I don't believe the right thing to do is to, to give the keys to, to, to the of the football club to anybody and just to, to let them do whatever they want. I want to have a say in who we recruit. Uh, but equally, I would uh, recruit anybody um, without the manager really, really wanting that player. I think it starts with the manager wanting that player. Uh, I think it starts with the coaches and the analysts uh, identifying that player as somebody who will make us better as a football club. Uh, but ultimately, um, I'm sure anybody who puts money into a business uh, would want to uh, rubber stamp that transfer or that signing uh, and say, yeah, I'm happy with that. Uh, let's go. So it's a very collective effort and uh, something that uh, uh, will be quite fluid uh, during this season and, and certainly um, decision makers at the end of the season when we get into pre-season. Can I just add something to that, Will, to be fair, that ultimately when I spoke to the players the last few days, I, I made that comment to the players, look, there's a lot of you that are out of contract come the end of the season. Well, Ultimately, you're playing for your future. If you want to stay here at Fleetwood Town, you've got to do whatever is required to make it very difficult for the powers of beta to not offer you a contract. If you are not offered a new deal here, we'll make sure you're playing well enough to, to go and get a deal elsewhere because there's going to be a lot of players that are going to be out of, uh, out of contract uh, in the summer. And that, is a, that isn't an easy place to be. So I think there's a big... I think it's a, there's a big incentive for a lot of our players to make sure that they perform, want to stay at a very football club with good facilities, or if they're not required by uh, by our football club next season, they're at least going down the line of putting themselves in the shop window. So really, it should be a win-win situation that players are, are bursting the gut to stay or get contracts elsewhere. Absolutely, and uh, one another one for for you, Simon. Oh no, sorry for Andy. Um, usually when when teams do well, the chairman are asked to sign lots of players. Mitchell Hulse wants to know, if we get promoted, will you be building a new stadium? I won't be building a new stadium, Mitchell, no. no not, certainly not this stage. Um, initially, I think what we'd have to do is we'd have to take stock of where we were capacity-wise. And uh, it would be a very pleasant problem if we were turning people away from Highbury on a regular basis. Uh, that's, you know, ultimately that's where we want to be. But being honest and being realistic promotion would not lead to such a, a, an immediate decision it's something that we'd have to assess over a period of time and once we were certain that it was the right thing to do and that uh, it would be in the best interest of the football club moving forwards and, and also the best interest of the town because uh, let's be honest um what a, a new stadium could do for the town of fleetwood the amount of employment and quality of life it would bring to the town and the area would be immense uh, so I'd love to do it one day, eventually. Uh, but the honest answer is on the back of the pandemic, if we were to uh, get into the playoffs and succeed, it wouldn't be a job for the summer. Definitely not. Not yet. Thank you very much. My lad, Steve Kerwood, back our CEO. Remember, he's in the background should we want to ask him any questions. There's been a few people ask about the documentary. Um, obviously, about a year ago, we released a trailer, very exciting looking trailer. Um, and there's been a couple of questions, one from Richard and one from Mitch Mitchell, and basically they're all asking where the documentary is. So between Steve and Andy, where is it? It's, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, um, well, frustrating to say the least. We had an offer from Sky to buy the documentary, but unfortunately, given Joey's outstanding court case, which was supposed to be heard last June and wasn't because of the pandemic, Unfortunately, Sky and other broadcasters are unable to screen it due to the outstanding legal proceedings, which also has an implication on being able to screen documentaries portraying Joey. So, unfortunately, that situation, as simple as it is, has frustrated the process. However, we have continued to conclude filming for what will be a sixth episode. So, it's going to run across three seasons, essentially. And the sixth episode is just... Only last week being concluded where, um, after Joey's departure, the camera crew have been out to see Joey, have been to see Andy, 
have taken both of their thoughts to present to the end of the what we probably call series one. So we're still hopeful it will get aired um, following that court case, whenever that might be, it's scheduled for June, and then will allow us to uh, broadcast what is some a great watch. It's not just the um, the jeopardy of a season. This is more about characters within a football club. Um, so it is ta it is timeless, but it's not as timely as a season by season as the one Simon was um enjoyed i will say <laughs> but, hey, I, i'm not signed up to do another documentary <laughs> <by the way. laughs> i mean uh, what, what i would say is i mean i, I know i'm i'm biased but uh, uh it is a fantastic watch uh i think it's far um i think it's far better than the sunderland one i actually think it's better than the Leeds and the tottenham one uh because it takes uh the viewer into areas it gives access into areas which is quite extra extraordinary really uh there are uh the transfer deadline day in the boardroom there are um there's dressing room before uh matches uh half times there's afterwards um it's really uh gritty it's very passionate uh and i'm absolutely convinced it will be aired uh, it exists and we can air it one way or another uh, one way or another you will or if you want to you'll get the opportunity to watch it and i think it's uh an absolutely fantastic watch and, and hopefully i see no reason why it should be this summer when we get it out in the in summer uh juno we seemed a long time off but it's only four months now so uh, uh once that's out of the way uh, we can then uh, hopefully uh, get it aired get as many people to watch it as possible i think it'll be a fantastic advertisement for for the town for the area for the football club and uh it will it will reach out not just nationally i think internationally it'll put Fleetwood on the map. So uh, that's really something to look forward to. Yeah, I can echo that. Having seen a few episodes of it, it's very, very interesting indeed. One from Ricky Burden. This is for uh, Simon Grayson. Coming fresh into Fleetwood, Simon, what's Fleetwood FC's reputation in League One with other clubs? Well, after look, even when I've just come to the to the club recently, um, a lot of well wishes. <laughs> Then what a good football club and ambitious owner and facilities. And it wasn't something everybody in the football world and supporters didn't know already. Everybody's seen the rise of Fleetwood Town over the years. People have seen or heard about the, um, um, the Pillfoot, which is a fantastic facility. Probably one of the best training facilities that you're going to get in League One uh, and even better than probably some of the championship ones as well. So it is a great place for players to come to work. When you when you've got a facility that like that available, it, it, it's certainly a lot easier to attract players um, because it's where ninety percent, eighty percent of the time they're spent in the season, aren't they? You do go to the to the ground at the weekend, um, and but you're there Monday to Friday doing your stuff. You've got to be there in good, nice facilities, good environment where you've got lots of good people working, but also. Um, everything at your disposal and it was something that I've seen obviously because I've brought when I was at Preston and, and Blackpool I brought clubs to um, reserve games here and had a look round but it isn't until you really get amongst it all and you see the real in-depth of a training ground that you're really you're so impressed by it so uh, I think that's a big attraction to it um, and again people within the game look at Fleetwood Town squad and what the team have done over the last few years and say right they've gathered a real good squad together, very talented players. And obviously the last few weeks, it just hasn't worked um, and lost away a little bit, but there is a lots of quality and that's down to a lot of people who, who met the investment and um, the attraction of playing and coming to Fleetwood Town to get them there. So um, I, I don't think that anybody within the football world will, will have a bad word to say about Fleetwood Town and, and where the football club is and where it's come from and where potentially it's going to go as well. Since you're talking so well, we'll keep you talking. Peter Cox, what does David Dunn offer to you and to the club? Obviously, David Dunn's been brought in as your uh, assistant head coach. Uh, he's my driver. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, all serious. Look, Dunn is somebody who obviously I played with at Blackburn and, and know very well. We live close together, but that isn't the reason. He could live in Timbuk too, and I would probably still assign and brought him to the football club because I like his work ethic. We've got the same sort of philosophies of how we want to play the game. But I think what Dunny's got as well, he's got an understanding of the young players as well. Because he's been um, an under-23s coach at Blackburn, he understands how they work. He's also been a head coach at uh, Oldham to start with and Barrow recently, so he understands what makes first-team players 
players tick as well. So I think we've, we've got the nice balance there. Our football club is one that has got experienced players, but also younger players. And we've got to make sure that we develop our younger players and, and see pathways through for the academy players to come into the first team. And having somebody like David and myself, who appreciates the academy because obviously my son's at, been at Blackburn for a long time. I want people to be see that there's opportunities for younger players to get into our first team. And we've got to make sure that we improve them when they're coming up to the training ground with uh, sorry, onto the first team training pitches with us, that we develop them and encourage them to be as successful as hopefully we can do. So um, with David doing that and his all round knowledge, I think we've got a good fit. He's, he's hung, he's got hunger, he's got desire. He's got, he's, he's obviously, he was disappointed when he got sacked at Barra, but he couldn't wait to get working, um, going back to work and, and coming back to work with me as well. He was pestering me every day, more or less telling me when we're going back to work. Every job that came available, he's like, what about this one? What about that one? No, we're going to wait for the right ones. And uh, when when this one came available, we, we certainly both jumped at the opportunity. Great. And one for Simon. This is from Chris Smith. Sorry, one for Andy Pilly. This is from Chris Smith. Um, obviously, there have been a lot of comings and goings at, at, around the club in January, managerial and players. Was this always something you had in mind or has it been influenced by the pandemic and the situation in football at the moment? Well, I would say it's certainly nothing to do with the pandemic, the comings and goings. And on, on the playing front, if we work our way um, through um, through uh, the, the playing changes we've had to make, Chad ended up going to Preston, so we needed a, a very similar player. Uh, Kyle Vassell was identified as a, a strong, powerful forward, and uh, that was agreed from the, the powers that be at the football club at the time, uh, that he would be um, a suitable replacement. We have lost Paul Coots, and Glenn Whelan is, is injured currently, so it was the opinion that we needed a quality midfielder, uh, a ball-playing midfielder who can also uh, put his foot in, and Dan Batty uh, was, um, was identified. Uh, and obviously we, we, we lost Tom as well. That the right back was called back uh, by Stoke City. He's found his way now to uh, to uh, to New York from Fleetwood to New York. It was a, a tough choice, I'm sure, uh, but uh, he opted for uh, for New York surprisingly. And uh, we've managed to get uh, Yanis Danasian, yes, uh, got it right here, uh, in. And uh, Yanis uh, is a, is a real quality right back. So these are like for like replacements. And so there is no element, this is not pandemic cost-cutting. This is just reacting to the hand that we've been dealt. These are situations beyond our control. So what we've done as a football club is we've gone out and we think we've got the very best players that we could in those positions to, uh, uh, to replace the players who have left. And one for Simon along the bottom. This is from somebody watching on YouTube, Tyler Dodd. Simon, what's the situation with Glenn Whelan? I notice he hasn't been in the squad for the last few games. Yeah, Glenn, um, I think it was a Wigan game, came on and then got injured. Um, so he's had a problem with the Achilles. Um, I think we'll, we'll find out sort of more definite sort of time scale of how long he's going to be out for. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's been out injured, no other reason. Um, it's a shame because Glenn's obviously a very experienced player playing at the highest level, international football. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a loss to to not have somebody like him available, but it, then it gives somebody else um, an opportunity to come into the team and into the squad to make an impression. So, um, is, is the reason why he's not been around the team recently. One from Andrew Mills for, for Simon, and it's one that I'm sure you won't want to put too much pressure on yourself, but he asks, do you think you can still make the playoffs? Look, it's, it's not an unachievable a target. We're nine points away from them, um, 21 games to go. It's, it, it's certainly achievable. We've, we've just, what, when you come into a football club um, and the team is on a bad run, all you're going to do is try and get a win as soon as possible. And then you take this step, the next step, you build little blocks and, and build along the way. So we want, first part of call, first aim is to, Hopefully, win at the weekend, stop the get back to winning ways, and then we move on to to Tuesday night against Doncaster Rovers. The thing about um, between now and the end of the season, you are going through it's nearly Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday every nearly every week, uh, apart from the odd exception, and you only need to get a couple of back-to-back -back victories, 
and you can really get in amongst the area. It's a momentum thing. Um, people talk about momentum all the time, good and bad. We've had moment, uh, uh, momentum in the wrong direction um, at this moment in time, but there's no reason why a couple of wins back to back very quickly can get you going in the right direction again. So we're not putting pressure on on anybody else, the players. Uh, of course, we would love to try and get to the playoffs, and, and that is our aim if possible. But I think first and foremost is to get back to winning ways and then uh, we'll just see where it comes after that. But, um, yeah, we, we're looking to to do whatever we can do and, and see where it takes us, really. Good to have uh, so many people watching tonight. We've got almost a 1,000 across all the different platforms, which is fantastic. Um, the, the, the comments are flying up on the screen to my right here, and I've had a couple of people saying, you've not read out my questions. So if, there's, if you do miss, uh, bear with us, and we'll try and get through as many. Do type it again if you're, if you're really struggling. One, um, and I, this, I suppose this is for... For Simon Martin Crane, is Simon Wiles still involved in the first team coaching setup? Yes, he is. Um, look, I know Simon. I played alongside him, um, and and he played under me at Blackpool. Um, I've got a good staff. I know the staff. Stephen Crane played under me at Blackpool. David Lucas at Leeds. Barry Nicholson. I've seen around obviously many times at um, with games. Um, so I've, I've got a staff there that I know that I, that uh, I think will help us. That we can all work extremely hard. Uh, with Simon, um, between me and the owner, we spoke about it and we wanted to give Simon the opportunity, really. Um, if, if Simon felt that he, he wasn't quite ready for the first team setup, then um, then we, we were more than happy for him to go back to the under 18s. But when I asked that question, he said he wanted to be around us and, and see where it goes. He wants to learn. I think he obviously appreciates that I've been around the block a little bit with 15 years as a manager and he, he's just starting off. and. I think if uh, he's if he's around us all the time and taking sessions around the first team, then he'll certainly become a better uh, better coach, understanding how things work. Because he he's been thrown really in the deep end, doesn't he? Sort of gone from the under 18s coach to the first team, which is he, he thrive. He loved the opportunity to do that. I think he, he him and his uh, wife have just had a new baby as well, so he'll do anything to get out the house. I suppose, won't he? When you've just had a newborn to to take in the first team. Um, coaching role but I think he's got a lot of good key qualities he's enthusiastic he's passionate he's, he's knowledgeable he's obviously young and inexperienced but he's he's there to, to hopefully learn from me and, and one day maybe who knows where he's going to be in terms of his manager career I started out when I was 35 and um, I had the experience of Tony Parks alongside me which certainly helped me along the way and Simon hopefully is going to learn a few things off myself and uh, some good things and bad things he, he won't always agree with everything that I do and but hopefully he'll pick up a lot of pointers that will help him in his long-term development as a as a coach, stroke manager in the future. If he turns around in a few weeks' time and goes, first team football's not for me, I want to go back, then we will sort of let him do that. I'm not holding him to do anything, but I do enjoy uh, Jeremy as a person, but also his attitude to being around the first team and, and the coaching as well. Uh, I think we'll all echo that because Simon's a, a guy that a lot of people inside the football club um, have big hopes for, including um, Andy Pilly. And one question for Andy, the chairman is from Tony Hewlett. Um, he talks about the fact that we've just listened to Simon's targets for the season, but what's yours, Andy? What, what Between now and the end of the season, what do you hope for the football club? I hope for the football club that we can amass as many points as we possibly can. Uh, I love the feeling uh, of winning football. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a good loser. I don't think any of us are. So um, the target for me, there's no pressure in the playoffs. That would be an incredible bonus. Would be they'd be gratefully received. But we, we, you know, we have to live very much in the real world. Nine points. We need we need real momentum. So we need to turn around the one that we're on now and uh, get in the winning groove. Uh, as Simon says, it's not impossible, but there's no pressure. Uh, it's very strange football right now. It really is because it's uh, without supporters there. It's very different. And I've been fortunate enough to still be able to go to to go to uh, football matches and without the uh, the noise from the crowd and the uh, the influence that the crowd have on the players, it's uh, it's just incredibly different. So it's not going to be my favourite season when I look back on um, on various seasons. And and I think this is one of the positives about tonight. We are interacting with the supporters. Normally we'd be doing this in the Parkside Lounge and we'd have a uh, we'd have the lounge packed out and. Um, lots of interaction between uh, the manager and the club hierarchy and the supporters. It's nice we can still do this uh, over the internet, embracing modern technology. 
yeah, and it's something we intend to do to do a lot more of between now and the end of the season. Now that the, we know the technology works well, uh, we'll get the players on, we'll get key people. So if you if there's anybody you want to hear from inside the football club, let us know, and we'll set up these events on a regular basis. Um, question, and, and this is an interesting one about Callum Camps. Callum, a player that everybody who's watched Fleetwood with this season was very and is very excited about, burst onto the scene, scored a hatful of goals. So the question to from Tommy Dean is, Simon, do you think you can get Callum Camps back in form? Well, hopefully that is a, that's a good point. I, I really like Callum Camps as a player. I liked him when he was at Rochdale. I always knew that when he was playing against us, the teams that I managed, he was always um, he was always a threat, a goal scoring off midfield player who could score from inside the box. He could score outside the box, and uh, if anything, Callum's probably hit the ground running too quickly, hasn't he? It's very difficult as a midfield player to to keep that goal scoring ability going. Um, even the, the players in the Premier League find it difficult and go through little spells where it's not quite dropping for you. Uh, but what we will be doing, we'll be trying to encourage him to get forward, getting into him key areas, getting to, um, don't, turning down opportunities to, to get his shooting boots on and, and hitting the target and get back to winning ways. And it's a little um, scoring ways. This is a little bit, bit like when you're playing games when you've not won and you want to win the next one to try and get a little bit of momentum going. And it's the same as players. Confidence is a, is a massive part um, in any professional sportsman, but also, but most notably in, in football. So, um, really like Callum. Really good attitude, and ultimately as well, I think he's a real good footballer. So, I think uh, I think we will be will be um, I think we'll be very surprised if Callum Camps hasn't scored um, a few more goals be between now and the end of the season. Let's hope it's another ten. Well, the owner does because he probably thinks he can get five ten million for it. <laughs> He wants more than 10 million, I think. Um, one from Rick Gilby, and he, he doesn't mess about here, does Rick? Big fan of the club and uh, regular at all our events. Um, Simon, after speaking to friends, some Blackpool, some Preston, spoke, some um, all speak very highly of the fact you get the best out of players and your promotion speak for yourself. But well, their criticism is the football's negative and it's a long ball game. What's your answer to that? Look, it's it's all opinion, isn't it? All I like to do is is play winning football and and, and do whatever you need to do. If it depends on the personnel that you've got available at your disposal, um, it's everybody is fascinated and, and really taken aback by sort of people having six, seven hundred, eight hundred passes and playing the beautiful tippy tappy game. When sometimes you can play it a little bit more um, quicker, possession doesn't ultimately win your games all the time. I remember. One of the biggest things that I have with that is that when I was a Preston manager at Wembley, Swindon had 70% possession of the game and we beat them 4-0. And, and so you have to you do whatever is required to win football matches. As I mentioned at the start of that answer, it's about what players you have at your disposal. If, if you've got good, talented um, technicians, passers of the ball at the back, well, you're going to play out from from the back and play into midfield players. If you've only got a small strikers, you're not going to go from back to front. So you've got to have the right fit within the group that's that you've got you um, that you select and and you're working with. So that's that's really where we are in terms of the group that we had. When we had, I'll go back to Preston, where I had Joe Garner and Jermaine Beckford. They were massive massive threats so why not get your best players and your big threats on the ball as quickly as possible rather than no disrespect to Tom Hunt, Tom Clark or Paul Hunt who they work great on the ball but they've put the bodies on the line in the defensive side um, we've got talented centre-backs in terms of Charlie Mulgrew Callum Connolly are very good on the ball but, but we've also got the physical presence of, of um, Paddy Madden Kyle Vassell and, and Harvey Saunders to run over the top so hopefully we will mix it up. We've got talented players in the middle of the pitch. Mark Duffy, uh, Barry Mackay, uh, midfield players, uh, Jordan Rossiter, Dan, Dan Batty, Callum Camps, as we mentioned. So there's lots of good players. We will play in a certain way whatever to win football matches. And, and that's the big thing that I've used many times. Is when people ask me about my style of football, I said I want to play winning football. It's quite in the... Um, Chris Wilder, um, uh, Sean Dice mould of do whatever's required to go and win football matches. So I don't think any of them clubs will have been mourning too much about my style of football when um, when they were celebrating the promotions. Absolutely. Um, one thing we miss about not being having these events in the Parkside Suite is Beryl Laycock, who's a popular um, 
supporter of ours who always welcomes the managers. Well, she's care she's caring about you, Andy. She said she she knows it must be really tough running our fabulous football club in these difficult times. Does it get you down? What's happening at the moment? The no fans, the the, the, the pandemic, it, and she's concerned that this is getting you down a little bit. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I think I think if you're going to do a job like be the the, the chairman of a football club. You've got to be. You've got to be quite robust. You've got to be. Uh, you've got to be prepared to roll with the punches. And I've done this for a long time. It's a massive ups and downs. The highs are fantastic, but um, you will go on. Um, you go through difficult times, just like you'll go through some fantastic times. And you've just got to. You've got to keep on going. You've got to plan. Uh, what I would say is, whilst we've been on pause, it's given us the opportunity, perhaps, to reflect on. On some of the processes, some of the um, some of the ways that we run the football club, and we want to be in a position when we we are eventually given the green light for the government to start again, to ensure that the product and the match day experience is better than it's ever been when everyone's allowed back to Highbury. So we've had lots of meetings about that, and I think you've got to use this time wisely. You can't just feel sorry for yourself; it's not going to do any good. Uh, you have to. Uh, you've got to be strong, you've got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to get through this difficult period. Um, we're not sure when the light is going to appear at the end of the tunnel, uh, but we're made of stern stuff and uh, we'll see out these difficult times and come back stronger than ever once normality resumes. It's great to see all the people still commenting. We've got about 10 minutes more to go um, and then and then we'll call this an out on, on, on this occasion. We'll do it again uh, very shortly. Um, but we'll keep going to the comments. The next one, um, Tony Medley has asked Andy Pilly, um, is it likely that Simon Grayson is one for, Is this your agent, by the way, Simon? Um, <laughs> is it likely that Simon could be given a longer contract if things go well? I really hope so, yeah. Um, I think that um, we're getting on very well as it is now. Uh, I think what will happen in football is contracts maybe with players, with managers, as a, as a direct result of the pandemic. Uh, and um, all football clubs will have to be more more prudent, more careful with the contracts. They offer. Um, and this is almost a uh, an opportunity, really, what I'd say for Simon to see if he likes us, for us to see if it works out for, for ourselves with Simon. And uh, nothing would make me more delighted than to, uh, to sit down with Simon to thrash out uh, a much longer term contract. Uh, but this is um, it's an opportunity for both parties to see if they enjoy um, working with one another and uh, let's hope that for the future it's a, a long-term relationship uh, that benefits both parties. And we, we can't be accused of only asking the, the easy questions. John Harrop, um, one for the chairman, he said recently Joey Barton has gone on record saying that the chairman picks the goalkeeper. Um, he wants to know how much influence you have on the team. Right, uh, I think I need to dismiss a few myths here with the uh, with the goalkeeping situation. We were in a situation whereby, when a pandemic, we have a, a salary cap, and the salary cap is key. We've only got a certain amount of money to spend, and with the return of Joel Coleman, I, I was getting Joel Coleman mixed up with a member of my uh, my management team. His name's very similar, um, and. With the return of Joel Coleman, uh, we had Alex Cairns and Joel Coleman, who are two exceptional number one goalkeepers, who I think would walk into any team in League One. And my view is we simply didn't need another one. So it would have been madness to have three number one goalkeepers. The contract was up of Jason Luke Viola, and we simply didn't need him. So it's very, very rare I say no to a manager, uh, but it was illogical and it would have been pointless to have extended Jason's contract when we had Alex and we had um, Joel available as well. Great. And this is one from Tony Hewlett. Um, yeah, a bit of tongue in cheek, maybe, I suppose, this one, but it's about uh, the, the rivals of Blackpool. Um, no doubt, Simon, that you're aware that Fleet would have never won at Bloomfield Road. Um, we visit them next month. How special would it be for you to be the first Fleetwood manager in history to win at Bloomfield Road? <laughs> I, any time there's any records to be broken, whether it's teams that I've played against, managed, played for, what, etc., I'll take that and I'll have that on any CV. So if, if it means me being the first um, 
Fleetwood Town manager to beat Blackpool at Bloomfield Road. Well, so be it. I'm employed by uh, Fleetwood Town to do whatever is required to go and win football matches. So, um, um, yeah, I will uh, I will hold that in high regard if we manage to do that. And it's certainly something we will be looking to do. And go on, we'll carry on with the, uh, the questions. FTFC fan page, how close was Josh Morris to signing for Charlton? Um, well, I'll answer that. But basically, we were um, we were asked a question by Charlton um, later on in the window. Um, but I pr literally that afternoon, I think maybe lunchtime or something, David Dunn, I got him to ring Josh Morris and say, look, because uh, he knew him. Uh, there was the odd rumour that there was a few other clubs that were sniffing around Josh. And I said, look, ring him up and tell him that we want him to be here from now to the end of the season, if not longer, um, like him as a player. And tell him that it's he's here. We want him. He's not going anywhere. And his words back to us was that um, they're the words that he wanted to hear. So um, we put that to bed very quickly. Um, ultimately, then whatever happens later on in the window, then then these things do happen. That people do ask questions. But I could have traded one or two other players in, but I didn't want to do that um because i felt that i wanted to make sure that i give players the opportunity to, to perform and they're already a good football club what if charlton are wanting josh morris it tells me that uh he's a good footballer because charlton are a, are a big football club that are looking to get into the playoffs and promotion into the championship so why not keep the best players and and try and get the get the best out of them and utilize them for our football club so uh yeah later on there might have been sort of a few more people sniffing around but it was it's the same Deadline day is always the same. I've, I've been involved in many, many, as you can imagine, and you are spinning this player around and another one, and then you, you, you're spilling a few home truths, you're telling a few porkings, you're doing this, you're doing that, and ultimately you are doing what's best to try and see what's out there, and then you have your choice of one, two, and three, and, and you do your deals that way. But the bottom line is that we didn't want Josh Morris to go anywhere, hence why he stayed. We're getting to the, the very end now. Um, it's been a real success, this. The comments are really positive on the on the round. We really appreciate everybody for, for tuning in tonight. We'll do this again soon. Um, one for Andy from Cobb's Chat, which is our uh, with one of our fan groups on Twitter. Um, he's asking about the identity of the club, Andy. He said, we went down the youth route, then we changed tack under Joey. And while recruitment has been better, from the outside looking in, there doesn't seem to be a consistent plan with the youth. What's your what's your plan and your your um, identity towards the youth and the academy? I mean, what I would say is there there are, there are two uh, there are two ways that I measure success as the chairman of the owner of the football club, and that is primarily we have to win football matches. It's about sporting success. It's about finishing as high as we possibly can up that table. However, that said, the other thing which is incredibly important is. Uh, there's, a, there's been a huge amount of money spent on pool football, best part of £10 million. And that is in order to develop football players, to create a pathway um, through from the academy to the under 18s, to the under 23s, uh, and ultimately to the first team. And so I would love to see some players eventually making their way through to the first team. There has been numerous uh, this season so far. Uh, but what I would say is we need to manage everyone's expectancy and those young players. It, there's nothing only about players being in the team and going out and coming in again and gradually gaining that experience over a period of time. Um, I think our, our development, we're absolutely committed to it. I know it's a big part of Simon's um, thought process as well, uh, but we must win football games, but also, also we must develop football players and uh, we must get them in the first team and ultimately into the Premier League. Well, can I can I just jump in there on that? Yeah. Um, I think, like as Andy said, the investment in Pilfoot is has been, you know, probably uh, unquantifiable across League One. With this is probably the best facility in League One. The academy is in Year Six now, um, and academies that we've seen such as Crew Alexandra and and others have been going at this decades. We're six years into it, and we are now one of the leading category two academies in the country sorry category three plans to go yeah. two in the summer um so it's come on phenomenally we've got some real talented boys there but these boys have got to remember um and this is notwithstanding we've already got james hill harrison <laughs> Holt, ryan rydell um uh, bagley and, and boyle johnston all around the first team at the moment in that squad 
it <clears> takes <throat> a long, long time to get there. But we've got some real quality boys coming through the system now. We've had bids for some of them from Premier League clubs. But, you know, and it's not always easy to try and keep them in your building. But because of Poolfoot, because of the infrastructure, because of the proximity to the first team environment, the opportunities become greater. And I think over the coming years, the balance will be tipped towards the academy, not wholly and solely, because that's not what we are. There is a blend of that important element of experience, but we will start to see some more of our own. With salary caps, post-pandemic, um, post-Brexit, these academy players will be so much more important than for our future than maybe they have been, and we're so young into this, so we are in our infancy. So I think, watch this space, but real, real positive signs in there. Can I just... Can I just jump off the back of that, to be fair, that the first thing I said with the players meeting uh, on Tuesday was, I don't care if you're 35 and got 700 league games or you're 16, 17, 18 and got no no league games under your belt. If you show me in training on a daily basis that you are good enough to play for our first team, then you will get an opportunity. I've, I've proved that in the past, giving 15, 16-year-old people the debut um, while they're still at school last year when I was at Blackpool and other clubs as well. So there is a. I want there to be a pathway for our academy players. I had this conversation with the academy staff yesterday about how what I expect from them um, as staff to give the academy group of players the best opportunity to be knocking on my door to say, look, Gaffer, you need to have a look at this play. He's going to be, he's close to being, we'd like to think, give him the opportunity around the first team. Um, and now it's a conversation that I was, I will be having with the academy players, the under 18s tomorrow as well, to tell them that the need to work hard and set the goals of getting into the first team. We could have quite easily as a club decided to go down the route and get some more experienced players in this window. But we brought Nathan Sharon back, who's been on loan at St Mirren, Harrison Biggins at Barrow. They've sampled first-team football, so why don't we just give them the opportunity to be in around it? Let me see what they're like in training, and if they're, if they're impressed, then they've got a chance to play. You will see somebody who's come through the academy, I'm pretty sure, in the team Saturday, if not Saturday, Tuesday night, without a shadow of doubt, because we've got some good young players and they need a pathway and an opportunity and guidance to help them to get into that, into that club. Because I want parents to be saying to their under-14s now, Look at him. He was in. The, he was an under fourteen three years ago. Look at him now. He's playing in Fleetwood Town's first team, and that will attract you better, younger players to our academy because they're going to see a pathway into the first team, which they all want. And you can all see the passion there from the, the three guys at the top. Just what just what passion there is for the for the youth academy. Just a couple of people to mention. The comments are quite um, interesting coming in. John Harrop just wants to big, give a big shout out to George McLaughlin. I think we all um, agree there. George is still in hospital um, fighting to get back out behind that goal and uh, and we all really miss him and hopefully he'll be back sooner rather than later. And on a lighter note, um, anybody who's on Twitter will, will know there's a fan called jo uh, called Jordan who, who basically, every time we sign a player, every time um, he joins, he asks them to go for a pint in the, in the Kings, which is a pub in Fleetwood. So he's been peppering us tonight to see if anybody on the panel wants to go for a pint with him. So... I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll get Andy. You can just go for a pint with him and shut him up. But uh, I think Harry Suter the other day agreed as well. So we'll get Jordan a pint. Right on a on a, on a lighter note, we're going to finish now. Um, just a la final final words, really. Um, Andy, your, your final words to to the supporters. I mean, first of all, I'd like to say personally, I've really really enjoyed this. I've, I've missed enormously interacting with the supporters. Uh, this is uh, events like tonight is what football clubs uh, all about, and it and it feels. Um, it feels a little bit more normal and it's, uh, um, as I say, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, so please uh, stick with us and uh, back us um, as much as you can on the internet and social media and hopefully we'll see you back at Highbury very, very soon. Great. And as for Simon, it's your uh, first game at the weekend. It's finally, it's been a long week for you, but we're finally getting towards the game. Friday, last preparations tomorrow. Bristol Rovers at home. Um, are you looking forward to it? Oh, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, not been in dugout for a, for a bit uh, now. Um, missed it. Been normally it's a soccer Saturday, opening a can of beer about five to three, watching all the results come in with Jeff Stelling and the boys, or if I've been going to games doing some media work. So it's going to be it's going to be really exciting at the weekend. It's just a shame that there's going to be no supporters in uh, to, in Highbury. But what we want to do is we want to get back to winning ways. We want to show passion, desire. We want people. 
working extremely hard and giving everything that's required to go and win a football match. If we can go and win the game in a real sort of uh, aggressive manner, playing beautiful freestyling football and win quite comfortably, everybody will be happy. If we go and have nick a one niller in the last minute off somebody's backside, then I think everybody will be just as equally happy and then we can move on to the next game and uh, let's 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 really embrace the last 21 games of the season. There's been negativity, of course, with results, but we, with an, we've got now a fresh start with us all and I'm giving everybody a fresh opportunity. Let's go and enjoy this ride that's going to take us to the end of the season and see where it takes us. What a good way to end the evening. So thank you very much for everybody who's joined us. It's been, a, it's been a great evening. I think from the comments, everybody's enjoyed it too. So thanks to Steve Kerwood. Thanks to Simon Grayson. And of course, thanks to the chairman, Andy Pilly. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. And hopefully we'll see you back at Ivory. Good night. <laughs>